I am Dimitris Mitras. I am um, with the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I will be talking today about the hemodynamic significance of stenosis from CT angiography, uh, specifically from the transluminal attenuation gradient perspective. So if you think about lesion significance, the end result of it is a lack of oxygen supply to the underlying myocardium, and CT perfusion can show us that. Um, similarly, CT, the CT angiogram can show us the conduit very well, and but in between the two, between the conduit where the blood flows and where it goes and whether it reaches there, there is the blood flow, and CT currently does not have the ability to show us that at all. There are a couple of solutions that are starting to emerge. One of them is the now infamous heart flow technology, which is based on computational fluid dynamics. And then there's another camp, which is the transluminal attenuation gradient, which is based on looking at the contrast kinetics within the CTA. And I will also talk a little bit today about the what I think might be the future um, convergence of the two technologies. So let's start first with what is the TAG and some results to date and some case examples. So the TAG emerged from the observation that when, you, that, uh, uh, when we got the first 320 detector row CT, we expected a coronary artery, which is imaged at the, in its entirety in a single moment in time, to have the same opacification throughout its length. However, what we found is that even in normal arteries, there was a small uh, drop-off in enhancement from proximally to distally, about 45 Hounsfield units, the same among all the main coronary arteries. When we looked at coronary arteries with significant stenoses, um, actually, there's a mistake, it should be greater than 75% lesions, that drop-off was much larger. So that gave us the impression that there might be something in the contrast enhancement along a vessel um, at isotemporal 320 detector OCT that might convey something about the flow. So the tag basically was an easy way to summarize that drop-off in contrast enhancement along the artery. If you think about the proximal luminal enhancement measurement and the distal luminal enhancement measurement, basically you can put them, the Hounsfield, you can take the Hounsfield units put them in a graph where the x-axis is just the distance between the two locations. Of course, instead of doing this at only two locations, you can do it at very regular intervals along the length of an artery and make a very dense graph, which you can then summarize with a simple linear regression and come up with a number that tells you what is the average drop-off in enhancement per centimeter of artery. In this example, say minus 8.3 Hounsfield units per centimeter of artery, meaning that if the proximal value is 300 Hounsfield units and you go 10 centimeters further down the artery, you expect to find about 217 Hounsfield units in the lumen. Now, one of the nice things about the tag is that because it is a linear fit of a, of a very dense data set, um, it is easy to compute, but it's also very robust in the presence of artifacts, such as, um, say, for example, beam hardening due to calcium or errors in your segmentation. Now, a number of groups have looked into uh, validating the use of TAG with respect to detecting functionally significant stenoses, um, and those are typically described by the fractional flow reserve. And one of the studies from the Melbourne, the Melbourne group here shows that tagged, uh, computed from 320 detector OC team, significantly improved both sensitivity and specificity to detect a clinically relevant reduction in fractional flow reserve. If you take a closer look, though, at the scatter plot, you will see that um, the correlation between invasive FFR and the transluminal attenuation gradient, while it is there, is not exactly strong. And this is something that I will come back to again later on. Now, in terms of the other studies that have been done, they all have shown a correlation between TAG and fractional flow reserve, but similar scatter plots. And in fact, to date, only 320 detector row CT seems to provide a TAG value that actually correlates with fractional flow reserve. 64 and lower detector rows, and even 256, one study more re recent than is shown here, did not find a significant um, uh, reclassification of patients. Now, some examples here up on the left side. There is a case with a spec defect in the LAD territory and a 
large tag of minus 13.3 Hounsfield units per centimeter, and on the right, a, a normal coronary artery by CTA with a much smaller tag of minus 4.6 Hounsfield units per centimeter, as you would expect. Here is another example with a, the case with a fractional flow, a lesion with a fractional flow reserve of 0.33, very significant, and a similarly large um, tag of minus 14.6 Hounsfield units per centimeter. But now here on the right, there is another case that is normal by CTA, and it has a tag that is much larger, minus 20.3 uh, 20 Hounsfield units per centimeter. So one might ask, first, why is this happening? And secondly, how are we going to deal with it? Um, let me put that aside for a little while, and let's go back to lesion hemodynamic significance and look at fractional flow reserve and other ways for CT to give us that information about the hemodynamic significance of a lesion. In an invasive catheterization, uh, one is, um, looks at the pressure proximal and distal to a stenosis, and if their ratio is less than 0.8, then the lesion is thought to be hemodynamically significant in the sense that it's actually impeding flow. It's causing resistance to flow. In a normal ep epicardial artery, there should be no pressure drop needed to drive the flow. Of course, it's been shown that FFR is currently the best way to determine whether um, a lesion should be intervened upon or not. And this is a result from the... Um, a large fame study that showed that event-free survival was better when uh, PCI was guided by FFR rather than on geographic means, which just looks at the percent stenosis. Now, FFRCT is a new technology. It's the first of the two solutions that are available for, for using CT to get to hemodynamic significance of a lesion. And basically what it does, it starts with your CT and gives you a simulated FFR value. Now, how does it get to that value? Well, the way you start is by segmenting the coronary lumen from your CTA, and this segmentation produces a computer model, a mesh that a computer can use in conjunction with a set of values that you give it, describing how much flow is going into that model and how much is coming out of each branch. Given that information, a computer can solve the equations of motions for the fluid flow and come up with a nice solution, which then can be translated into pressures. And from those pressures, you basically can have a simulated FFR value. Of course, depending on the conditions that you give the computer and ask it to solve the, the system of equations, it'll give you a different set of pressures and therefore a different FFR. For example, in this lesion here, one simulation might produce an FFR of 0.89, which is not significant, and another one might produce an FFR of 0.68, which is significant, considering the 0.8 cutoff used clinically. So which one is correct, and why do, they, do we get the two different numbers? Well, these two simulations were done as follows. One, they both assumed a hyperemic flow of 439 milliliters per minute, but the first one assumed that the LAD territory only requires 86 milliliters per minute. Um, whereas the other one assumed that the LAD territory required 345 milliliters per minute. And those two solutions basically gave us the different FFR. Now, HeartFlow, it's a company that has one way of picking those uh, values and coming up with a good solution to the FFR uh, problem. And they do this with a very complicated um, system of equations that considers the entire circulation in the human body as a very simplistic uh, but very accurate model of an electrical circuit, and then coupling that with the three-dimensional CFD of the um, coronary arteries. Unfortunately, this coupled system of equations does require a supercomputer, some say, to solve. It does require quite a lot of computational power, and that has been one of the main critiques of hard flows FFRCT. Now, on the other hand, the results of FFRCT have been quite good to date. There have been three large uh, clinical trials. All of them showed a very uh, good correlation between FFR computed from CT and invasive FFR. All of them have shown an ROC curve, area under the curve of about 0.9 and higher. This is a technology that I believe in, works very well. And 
um, it'll definitely be used in the future. However, if you do take a closer look at the data and you look again at scatter plots, just like we did for tag, you will see that even though the correlation is there and it's very good and it does allow us to reclassify a lesion as being significant or not, the correlation is also not as tight as we'd like. So putting the two together, FFR CT versus invasive FFR and another example of tag versus invasive FFR, we see that the correlations, the plots are pretty much not that different. So tag does carry information about hemodynamics, but it seems that we're not getting at it correctly. And this is the next uh, step, I think, um, which is we need to understand what tag really means, and then we can figure out how to correctly use it to uh, quantify lesion hemodynamic significance. And towards this, this end, um, let's take a look at you know, a standard um, CT as it would happen. You inject the patient with a contrast agent. The contrast agent starts to flow through the vasculature. It arrives in the proximal uh, location here, the ascending aorta, and then it goes out through the descending aorta. And we have those two contrast passage curves. Now your volume CTA or spiral CTA or whatever it is, is acquired at a certain time when you think that you have enough contrast in the arteries to get a very nice image. But <clears throat> let's take a closer look at this problem. So let's say that someone gave you those two contrast passage curves in two locations in the vasculature, the proximal location and the distal location. What is the first thing that you would do? First thing that I would do is I would calculate the time between the two curves. Why? Well, because this time delta t is the time that it took contrast to flow from proximal location to distal location. What's the second thing that you would do? Second thing that I would do is I would calculate the distance between the two locations that those curves were acquired at. Why would I do those two things? Well, because that's just velocity, delta x divided by delta t. And of course, if you have blood velocity, you can get blood flow, volumetric blood flow, as area times velocity, cross-sectional area of the vessel times velocity. Now, the limitation of CT in a way for trying to get this type of flow information is that you only get information from a single moment in time with a volume CT. Now, in that CT, all you have really are, of course, the distance still, and the only thing that you can see regarding the enhancement is the proximal and the distal enhancement. So how do we translate this information that TAG effectively uses into flow? Well, let's look at this difference in Hounsfield units a little more carefully. Let's make the assumption that at the moment, at around the time that the CTA was being acquired, contrast was rising at a fixed rate of, let's say, 35 Hounsfield units per second. And now, let's say that the distal location is 70 Hounsfield units less than the proximal location. How long will it take if enhancement is rising at 35 Hounsfield units per second for the distal location to rise by 70 Hounsfield units? Well, of course, it's going to take just two seconds. Now, if I tell you also that the distance between the two points is 16 centimeters, then what is the blood velocity? 16 divided by 2, 8 centimeters per second. Now, if you work through the mathematics of this, basically what we have done is we have related the difference in Hounsfield units at uh, due to two different locations in the vasculature with the rate of contrast increase in time at around the time that the CT was acquired, times the time difference, the delay in time that it takes for contrast to go from one location to the next. And tag is nothing more than this difference in house film units expressed as a uh, per unit distance of vessel. If you work further through it, you find that there's a very simple relation relating the velocity and the inverse of the transluminal attenuation gradient. So blood flow is in fact nothing more than something that has to do with the inverse of tag times some parameter alpha that encapsulates, among other things, the rate of contrast increase um, during the CT acquisition and the vessel cross-section. Now let's look at a very simple example. Here on the left, there is the bolus tracking ROI uh, values, Hounsfield units, as you're waiting to start your CT acquisition. And you fit that to see that you have about a 
55.6 Hounsfield units per second increase in contrast enhancement. Then you trigger your scan, the bolus tracking ends, and a couple of seconds later you acquire your CTA. Let's go to the CTA and measure the tag. And we get the tag for the RCA, and we will find that using this information, the flow, the volumetric flow through this RCA comes out to be about a number of 55.3. We do the same thing for the LAD, 105.6. LCX, 123.3. Now those numbers look suspiciously like um, the actual volumetric fl flow rates that you'd expect in a left dominant um, circulation, which this is, the CTA is an example of. So in, in fact, this is precisely what we did for a first level uh, validation of um, this underlying physical principle. And what we did is we looked at precisely right and left dominant circulation, where we know from large trials what the average flow going in, down each main coronary artery is. We then took a small number of CTs and looked at what relative flows they give using this information. And what we found is that, in fact, we get fairly relevant numbers that uh, follow the expected pa uh, patterns of relative flows. Now that we have an idea towards uh, what tag really means, the next question to ask is how can it be used to determine lesion significance correctly? Uh, well, there are a number of factors that go into this model, and we need to make sure that each one does in fact correspond to what we do in practice. So for example, if we take TAG and correlate it directly to FFR, we need to ask, well, how about the uh, rate of contrast increase leading up to the CTA? Is that, can that be dropped so that we don't have to account for it and do this correlation? Secondly, we need to ask, well, when does the TAG uh, in fact reflect flow? When does this model hold? And thirdly, we know that lesion significance is defined at stress, not at rest, and a CTA is performed at rest. So any information that we can extract from CTA regarding blood flow will be about rest flow. Regarding the first item on the list, well, we know a number of factors that affect the contrast passage uh, after an, an intravenous injection, and some of them actually do change the bolus, sh the bolus shape so that, in fact, they do change this assumption, this assumed alpha factor um, does uh, change based on a number of uh, both patient-specific as well as uh, scan parameters such as injection rate or what protocol you're using and blood volume. So it appears at least at first the tag cannot be directly compared between patients. Uh, as for the second item on the list, when does this model hold? Well, it appears that it uh, the, uh, the intrinsic assumption is that um, the moments leading up to the CTA, contrast inflow uh, increase was, was fairly constant. This only holds during the upslope of the contrast passage and also in the downslope, but does, does not hold during the upslope. So you need to perform your CTA at the right time in order to be able to extract information about flow using TAG. As for the last item, how can we use TAG correctly to determine uh, lesion hemodynamic significance as defined by FFR. Well, if we can inform the boundary conditions for the computational model using the transluminal attenuation gradient and its relationship to flow to determine how much flow is going down each branch of the uh, coronary artery tree, then we can scale that to hyperemic flow and end up with a FFR that is simulated but from patient-specific um, flow conditions that were measured directly from the CTA. So in, in summary, what we can fairly confidently say is that coronary contrast enhancement and its drop off along a vessel, um, as determined, for example, by the TAG, under certain conditions is a compendium of factors with flow being just one of them. And these factors are, however, very specific and and can likely be explicitly calculated from the CTA. So that would mean that we can get rest flow from CT angiography using something like the tag. And that also, however, means that the flow that we get, because it's rest flow, it probably doesn't as directly correlate to FFR as 
we would like. And uh, one way to overcome this last final problem is to use the information that we obtain for flow from the CT uh, angiogram as patient-specific boundary conditions uh, to calculate FFR. Thank you.